on peace. <clears throat> I now invite, uh, we will have two speakers in this session. I now invite Admiral Jayant Pereira, former Chief of Naval Staff, Sri Lankan Navy, to kindly come forward and occupy his chair on the dais. Admiral Jayant Pereira is the 19th commander of the Sri Lankan Navy. Prior to being appointed as a Navy commander, he held the post of Chief of Staff of the Sri Lankan Navy. The Admiral joined the Sri Lankan Navy on 23rd August 1978 and underwent his basic training at the Naval and Maritime Academy in Trincomalee. After retiring from the Sri Lankan Navy, he served as the advisor to the President of Sri Lanka from July 2015 to July 2016. May I now invite Major General James S. Hartsell, Mobilization Assistant to the Commander, U.S. Pacific Command, to kindly come forward and occupy his chair on the dais. General Hartsell began his Marine Corps career in 1981 as an enlisted Marine and served with Third Force Reconnaissance Company, Mobile AL. Upon graduation from University of South Alabama, he was commissioned a second lieutenant in 1983. Upon promotion to Brigadier General in 2010, he was assigned as a Deputy Commanding General, IMEF Mobilization, and then served as Commanding General of the 4th Marine Division from 2012 to 2014. He is currently assigned as the Chief of Staff and Mobilization Assistant to Commander U.S. Pacific Command. He is also serving as a Director of the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii. I now request Admiral Jayant Pereira to address the delegates. Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I consider it's a great honor and a privilege to address this gathering. And I want to thank the Indian Foundation for inviting me as one of the guest speakers. I'm very happy to see a lot of contemporaries where I have met and my commandant of Wellington Staff College is also here, General Manik. And uh, with India and Sri Lanka, we have a lot of interactions. We have met frequently and visited. I think uh, myself, I have visited many times. I have done, people call me as a half Indian because I have done a lot of training there. So, gentlemen, uh, I was attending from last evening. Everybody is talking on the same matter. So I'm also covering little aspects. I selected to the topic, the way forward in building peace through partnership in the Indian Ocean region based on common security architect. Ladies and gentlemen, it is believed that maritime trade in the Indian Ocean region involving this island nation was flourishing even 5,000 years ago. Anyone studying the maritime history of Sri Lanka and the Asian region will come across abundance of evidence to ascertain beyond any reasonable doubt that the Indian Ocean region, especially Sri Lanka, was at the center of vibrant sea route where seafarers who braved the uncertainties of ocean to sail far east to the west to engage in lucrative trade of spices and precise stones among many other communities. Ladies and gentlemen, the demand attraction and the resultant gain of the trade was such that European maritime powers wanted to have a permanent influence in the Indian Ocean. From around 15th century, European colonial powers started expanding and compete with each other to have the region under their sphere of influence. The colonization of the region by the European powers firmly established this influence. 
The European domination continued for about five centuries. This domination continued until the end of World War II. Thereafter, during the Cold War era, the power play in the Indian Ocean region changed into different dynamics. This has been widely discussed during many forums similar to this, and I will limit this to my introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, however, after a full cycle of dynamic changes in the political order in an established fact that the center of gravity of world economic growth has shifted towards the Asian region. Consequent to these developments, Indian Ocean region has gained serious attention of all global powers due to its connectivity to the Atlantic and the Pacific, driving the economic growth into region and the world. In this developing maritime-centric geopolitical and economic context, we in Sri Lanka, being in the most strategic location in the Indian Ocean, has attracted unprecedented focus as a potential maritime hub and a center of growth. At the same time, the importance of safeguarding the sea line of communication that connects the east and the west and vice versa in achieving stability and the peace in the region therefore has become a key strategic concern. This is especially due to the significance of the Indian Ocean acting as a conduit of the energy flow the Asia-Pacific Economic Growth Centers. The fact that this conference is held in Sri Lanka in any way recognizing of that reality, as we all know, the last year's conference was held in Singapore, a country that we in Sri Lanka aspired to emulate since early 80s. It is the country that benefited from strategically important maritime location and by adapting prudent strategies Although the Singapore model is something that Sri Lanka has been discussing in the last few decades, we have not been able to achieve success due to long-grown conflict that pushed our country backward and also partly due to lack of progressive policy framework. So as a maritime nation, the time has come to recognize how Sri Lanka should contribute to the overall Indian Ocean maritime security, peace and stability. And in the return grab the opportunities and reap the benefits that are right in front of our doorsteps. Ladies and gentlemen, however, all these factors depend on how Indian Ocean region maritime orders is shaped in order to sustain peace and stability through a consciousness approach of all stakeholders in coming years. Therefore, Sri Lanka is now passing through a period of drilling our maritime policies to suit the emerging maritime order of the Indian Ocean. It is apparent to anyone that many conferences, forums and discussions similar to this conference being held regularly and that the main focus in all such endeavors is to share views on how best the Indian Ocean security architecture should be formed to ensure that interests of all stakeholders are preserved while if efficiently managing the Indian Ocean region for common prosperity, peace and stability. Primarily, for unhindered oceanic train, unfettered access in the maritime domain in man is mandatory. It is maritime security which will underpin such access by allowing free movements of navigation, trade and lawful exploitation of resources. The enormity of the ocean space that surrounds us makes it mandatory that all countries who share common objectives and values in securing the seas confront the challenges in the collaborative manner. It is prudent to keep in mind that global maritime community is confronting an increasingly challenging security environment. Terrorism, all forms of smuggling, natural disasters, the increasing importance of space and cyber needs, compatible capacity and capability. Hence, strategic partnership and collaboration need to be pursued and encouraged by all state, states. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenges we face could be categorized for broad area. There are traditional challenges between state, non-traditional challenges by non-state actors, natural disasters and serious environmental concerns. The answer to these challenges lies with bilateral and multilateral framework of cooperation, capacity building and interoperability and agreements that commitment to adhere to a rule-based maritime order. In this context, the proposals that have been proposed through this forum itself towards building a common security architecture agreed by all 
all stakeholders become very important. Such consensus will lead to networking of navies in the collaborative approach towards peace and stability. More importantly, it will bring trust and confidence that shrinks space for disagreement and conflict and mitigate mistrust. I would like to mention that we have seen improved cooperation among the nations in the region and also supported by powerful maritime nations which are outside the region, but consider the region is vital for their national security interests. Even with such cooperation, many security challenges remain and many traditional and non-traditional challenges are evolved in the future. As shaping patterns changes and new transit hubs emerging, refocusing of effort will become necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, therefore, much cooperative efforts need to be formulated. Improving the accessibility for maritime domain awareness is a key factor in this proposed collaboration to efforts. Therefore, it is my view that assistance by advanced state in the region to smaller navies to increase their this capacity must be persistent. In conclusion, I would like to note in a very strategic context, we all have to be mindful that understand evolving security partnership that are centric to the Indian Ocean region. In this context, the outcome of the recent discussion between the leaders of India and US on maritime cooperation is of great importance. Both countries have a large presence and foothold in the Indian Ocean region and the commitment shown for increased cooperation and partnership and for the rule-based maritime order is encouraging and hope that such cooperation would bring greater stability to the region. Ladies and gentlemen, in this background, a common maritime security architecture, I would argue, has never been more opportunity for necess and necessary. It should allow cooperation and partnership, promote rule-based maritime activity, allow bilateral and multilateral cooperation, create space for assistance of needy nation to be supported by advanced nation for capacity building in the transparent approach, enhance maritime domain awareness, and most importantly, should have voluntary consensus on refraining of planning or carrying out action that hinders the security balance of the Indian Ocean region. I believe best course is that they all should strive to steer for a secure, stable and peaceful Indian Ocean region. Thank you. Um, thank you, Admiral. I now request General James S. Hartzell to address the gathering, please. such a pleasure to be here on behalf of Admiral Harry Harris, the commander of the United States Pacific Command. Uh, he sincerely regrets not being here in person. Uh, he intended to be here, uh, but due to the issues that uh, our command is dealing with in another part of our uh, area of operations in Northeast Asia, he physically could not be here, and I was asked to come and speak on his behalf. So I will be speaking his words, his ideas, and his thoughts this morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the India Foundation the uh, IOC organizing committee, and especially Sri Lankan Prime Minister Wickram Singha uh, for, as committee chair for extremely working hard and the tireless effort that was put into organizing and bringing all of us together here. And Pacific Command really appreciates being invited to this Indian Ocean Conference. I'm sure there was a lot of work that went into it, uh, and we really appreciate it. Pacific Command, a lot of people ask why is a United States military command part of this uh, committee, or, or not committee, part of this um, you know, IOC conference. You know, Pacific Command just celebrated its 70th anniversary last week. We organized as the United States Combatant Command uh, 70 years ago, and our focus has been and continues to be on the Indo-Asia Pacific region. We're responsible for all of the United States military activities in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. And we have 375,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, coast guardsmen, and Department of Defense civilian employees that work together focused on that area. For our 70 years, our mission started and continues to be and hasn't changed to protect and defend the territory of the United States, our people, and our interests. And our mission has been to do that by promoting security cooperation, 
with our allies and partners. By reinforcing rules-based international order, responding to contingencies and crisis in the area, deterring aggression, and when necessary, as a last resort, to fight. Our vision that Admiral Harris put into place a couple years ago when he came into command is that the Indo-Asia Pacific region is stable, prosperous, and characterized by rule-based order within the United States as the premier security partner of choice. So it's about partnering, and that's why we're here today. In the, and in that context, in the inner and connected world, as that increases more and more through social access and, and cyber and other ways, as we connect ourselves closer and closer over time, there's many challenges that will require cooperative multilateral solutions. Forums like this help us all to dig deep and to analyze the issues that impact all of our nations collectively. Something especially needed in this day and age, in the age of instant news, short sound bites that simply touch the surface or scratch the actual issue. We need academics, leaders, diplomats, scholars, and military people to work and act together to dig deep and see what the solutions are for our problems. It should come as no surprise to anybody here that the Indian Ocean region occupies a permission a position of immense strategic importance. All the speakers have talked about it. Admiral Harris and Pacific Command is acutely aware that today half of the world's container traffic, a third of the bulk transport cargo, and nearly two thirds of global maritime traffic go oil goes through these waters in the Indo uh, Indian Ocean. And from our military view, our military lens, the security implications attached to that level of commerce are enormous. The Indian Ocean region necessarily attracts geostrategic interest, both from states within and without the region. Two of the three largest economies in the world, China and Japan, along with many other nations, have vital vested interest in resources and trade that transits through the waters in the Indian Ocean. And this is a condition which has potential for simultaneous competition and cooperation. And that's why we need to talk and discuss and work on it together. It's worth noting the economies throughout the Indo-Asia Pacific region continue to flourish because of the collective respect for and adherence to international rules and standards that have produced the longest era of peace and prosperity in modern times in this region. Seventy years of sustained regional security and stability didn't just happen on its own. These conditions are not coincidental. Rather, they're a result of a commitment to a principled rule-based international system which affords all nations, large or small, the opportunity to reap the collective rewards of cooperation. As U.S. Defense Secretary Mattis stated at the recent Shangri-La Dialogues, the international order was not imposed on individual nations. Rather, the order is based on principles that were embraced by nations trying to create a better world and restore hope to all. These principles, which include freedom of navigation for military and civilian ships and aircraft, the peaceful resolution of disputes, the unimpeded lawful commerce, provide the foundation of a rule-based international order that has lifted so more than a billion people out of poverty and benefited so many nations for the last seven decades. The continued acceptance of this rule-based international system is being challenged, however, by some of the very nations that is most benefited. Unfortunately, some nations are choosing to reject the accepted frameworks of norms, standards, rules, and laws that are foundational, that have underpinned the international system and the inclusive security network that supports it. Instead, some nations pursue a more self-serving path. We see this development in the South China Sea amidst contested maritime claims and the contribution to decisions by an accepted international authority. China is using its military and economic power to dampen freedom of navigation in the South China Sea and in turn erode rules-based international order. It seems readily apparent that the Chinese are building up combat power and positional advantage in an attempt to assert de facto sovereignty over disputed maritime features and spaces in the South China Sea. In so doing, they're fundamentally altering the physical and political landscape by creating and military, militarizing man-made bases using tone-deaf propaganda at times to justify these unprovoked aggressions as measures to intend, as intended for rescuing wayward fishermen. As Admiral Harris has said recently, fake islands should not be believed by real people. 
The results of this aggressive attempt to apply national laws in international space are unsurprising. Angst and uncertainty are on the rise, causing alarm among neighboring nations as we see ever larger portions of national wealth that are being transferred by claimants and non-claimants alike to develop more capable naval forces, far beyond what is needed for merely self-defense. As worrisome, the principle of unfettered access to the global commons is at risk when nations make unilateral claims of sovereignty over global commons. Small nations with fewer resources to draw upon and at a clear disadvantage in terms of military might and power have little recourse but to begrudgingly accept coercive demands and cede the rights that rightfully belong to all nations. How the collective concert of nations deals with freedom of navigation issues has an impact well beyond the maritime domain. If states are willing to treat control of international spaces as up for grabs at sea, there's, no little, re there's little reason to consider that global commons within other domains like space or cyber are going to be any more protected. Accordingly, United States forces will continue to fly and sail and operate throughout the globe in accordance with international law to ensure that the privilege that's afforded to all nations is not superseded by the ambitions of just one. This is not to say that American and Chinese interests are locked in a spiral of escalation that will invariably lead to military clashes or conflict. That's not the case. On the contrary, our goal remains to work with and to convince China that its best future comes from peaceful cooperation, meaningful participation in a current rules-based international order, and honoring the international commitments it has made. But the United States will not allow shared domains to be closed down unilaterally. So Admiral Harris has stated, we'll cooperate where we can, but we must remain ready to confront when we have to. He also has stated, and always has emphasized, that we must not allow areas where China and the U.S. disagree to impact our ability to make progress on other areas where we do agree, and there's many of them. The United States, and in fact all of the Indo-Asian Pacific nations, should try to cooperate with China where we can. And the basis of this cooperation should begin with and end with norms and international law. I only highlight the South China Sea example not because it has been prevalent in regional security discussions for years now, but also because of the contrast with what Admiral Harris sees as the prevailing approach of resolution of maritime disputes here in the Indian Ocean region. Many countries in this region, including India, have demonstrated a commitment to long-standing customary international law. Prime Minister Modi of India has expressed that respecting freedom of navigation and adhering to international norms are essential for peace and economic growth in the interlinked geography of the Indo-Asia Pacific. More importantly, as example, the example is being set right here in the Indian Ocean by actions as well as by words. In 2012, as an example, the International Tribunal for the Law Sea decided a maritime border dispute between Bangladesh and Burma. The decision prevented Burma from cutting off Bangladesh from access to maritime resources due to its concave coastline. As a concession, the International Tribunal for Law of Sea created a gray area that allowed Bangladesh claim to the seabed while Burma controlled the exclusive economic zone waters above. The ruling also limited St. Martin's Island off the coast of Burma to a territorial sea, preventing Bangladesh from bumping out its exclusive economic zone from an offshore island. Both sides benefited from this ruling. Two years later, in 2014, the Permanent Court of Arbitration resolved a long-standing conflict or maritime border dispute between India and Bangladesh. At issue was the maritime border on Bangladesh's western border. In the court's decision, Bangladesh was awarded 80% of its claimed exclusive economic zone. Notably, India chose to abide by the ruling, despite being the much larger and much more powerful claimant. By displaying a willingness to use agreed upon dispute resolution mechanisms and abide by decisions conferred, India is using its role in the region as a leader to increase regional security and stability and to lay foundation for cooperation on other issues as well. That cooperation is key in an environment where collective challenges will require collective inclusive solutions. The same ocean that connects us and provides immense opportunities for national prosperity and improved quality of life also provides openings for non-state actors to exploit their advantages. One such manifestation has been piracy. It's prevalent in several areas of the Indo-Asian Pacific, including here, obviously, in the Indo Indo Indian Ocean. 
For a long time, piracy and armed robbery in the western Indian Ocean disrupted the delivery of humanitarian aid to Somalia. It threatened the vital sea lines of communication and economic interests off the Horn of Africa and in the Gulf of Aden and in the Indian Ocean, costing governments and the shipping industry nearly an estimated seven billion U.S. dollars in 2012 alone. It took a collective response of maritime nations and their navies, along with adjustments in shipping industry practices and policies, and a United Nations Security Council resolution to help reduce this threat to a more manageable level. But piracy has been and continues to be an ongoing challenge on the world's oceans, particularly where seams of governance and maritime security exist. We can look to the eastern Indian Ocean, for example, of effective anti-piracy cooperation. The Strait of Malacca patrols, cooperatively undertaken by Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand, have helped to dramatically reduce the number of piracy interest, in, incidents along that maritime choke point since its inception 12 years ago. As with many maritime challenges, however, the future success of anti-piracy efforts also depends on the conditions ashore that give rise to frictions at sea. Lawlessness, poverty, and humanitarian crises can, can cre create conditions in which piracy becomes an enticing option. Lawlessness ashore can also give rise to other challenges, like terrorism, that can impinge upon security conditions well beyond those shores where they originated from. We, know have, we have no clearer example of this than that of ISIS, the so-called Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. While the main geographic focus of the U.S.-led counter-ISIS coalition has rightfully been in the Middle East and North Africa, the ongoing military operations there continue to deny ISIS territory. We see radicalized and weaponized terrorists fleeing those areas and relocating and in many cases returning back home to inspire new fighters where they came from, including Indo-Asia-Pacific countries. Make no mistake, ISIS is a clear threat and must be defeated. Sadly, we're seeing the outsourcing of violent ideology come to fruition right now in the southern Philippines, where in 2016, Isnalan Hapalan, a commander of a local Abu Sayyaf group, was named the ISIS Amir of Southeast Asia. In just a matter of months, Hapalan started uniting elements of several violent extremist organizations, building a coalition under the ISIS black flag. These terrorists are using combat tactics that we've seen used in the Middle East to kill in the city of Moari in Mindanao, Philippines, right now, today. This being the first time and ISIS-inspired forces have banded together to fight on this kind of scale in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, Marari needs to be a wake-up call for every nation in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Foreign fighters are passing their ideology, their resources, and methods back home to local, homegrown, next-generation radicals. We must stop ISIS and all violent extremist groups that are like them at the front end and not at the back end when threat can become even more dangerous. But we cannot do it alone. Only through multinational collaboration can this, we work together to eradicate ISIS disease, which is supported and inspired by ISIS, here in the Indian Ocean Pacific area. We don't want it to spread any further than it already is. That's all bad news. The good news is that multinational efforts are underway to meet this challenge. Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines are deepening cooperation to fight regional piracy and related kidnapping for ransom in the Sulu Sea, as an example. Cooperative efforts in this vast and largely ungoverned maritime area connecting these three great nations and their islands of thou thousands of islands will help deny these terrorists maneuver space, recruiting opportunities, and revenue streams. This partnership, along with the Armed Forces of the Philippines, renewed offensive against the ISIS group in Mirari is another step in the right direction. It's the good news. Cooperation between Singapore and Indonesia is yet another high point. Because of the coordination between these two nations, a plot by a terrorist cell with links to ISIS to conduct an attack in Singapore was just recently broken up by Indonesian security forces. It took cooperation, collaboration, intelligence sharing to stop something that would have been horrific if it had followed through. What I hope these examples highlight is the immense value of collective, cooperative, inclusive approaches, and how these are very important to all of us who are affected as nations, and how we can address some of the most pressing regional challenges together. Joint patrols, inclusive military exercises, and sustained engagements enhance our ability to work together to combat maritime piracy, 
to protect trade and shipping routes, to deter terrorists, and provide humanitarian assistance during natural disasters. The United States will continue to look for ways that we can cooperate in all these areas with all nations in the Indo-Asia Pacific. This is a message that should resonate for all of us who are tasked with providing security upon which the continued stability and expanding prosperity of this region depend. I appreciate you listening and giving me the time this morning. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, General Hatzel. We have just heard two very fine uh, uh, presentation addresses, or one by Admiral Pereira and the second by General Hartzell. Uh, we have time now for the interactive session. Uh, your comments, your views, or your questions. Uh, kindly indicate the table number and we will begin with that. Uh, sir. Uh, I am Ram Mathav. I am the General Secretary of BJP in India, also the Director of the India Foundation. I have uh, one question each to both the panelists. Uh, first question to General Hartzell. You gave a wonderful presentation, very forthright, very frank uh, expression of uh, your views. But let me ask you, uh, this century began with a very ambitious project of uh, the USA about Trans-Pacific Partnership. We all in the region have uh, seen it as a very important initiative coming. We thought that uh, this will have a major impact on, although it was about uh, nations in the periphery, it will have a major impact on the affairs of our Indi Indian Ocean region also. But what happened to that? Why is it that uh, the current dispensation thinks that TPP is not going to be really useful for your country? Should we assume that it is dead, it is buried? Or should we assume that it, is, it will be in cold storage for some time until things change in the thinking or in the leadership of your country? That is uh, my question to you, sir. And also coupled with that, uh, I would also like to hear from you about what will be the future role of USA in the region with uh, no TPP arrangement happening and you will slowly be asked to probably leave Digo Garcia. Uh, what do you foresee as uh, your role in uh, the region? Is it going to diminish further? Assistant Secretary of State in the morning said, no question, we are very much there. We are not going to leave. But how, how do you see your role in the region? Uh, I have a question for Admiral Pereira also. So it's a very uh, question very specific to the recent uh, MOU between uh, your country and China about Hamban Thota. Uh, we know that you have an important naval base close to the Hamban Thota port. Is it going to remain there or under the new MOU your, your uh, naval base will also move out of that region? Secondly, how does Sri Lankan Navy look at this MOU? because we have seen in the past submarines of different countries also coming and docking at your ports. Do you foresee such things happening at Hamman Tota also? Then what will be the Sri Lankan Navy's view about this whole development on Hamman Tota? Thank you. Yeah, I'll be happy, happy to start. Well, yep, I assume you can hear me fine, right? You all hear me okay? Okay. Uh, being a military officer and working at Pacific Command, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is, that's a national level, uh, more of a diplomatic uh, statement or question to have answered. But obviously I have an opinion. Okay. Uh, when President Trump came in and also when Secretary Clinton was running for office, it seemed like she wasn't as interested in pursuing what had been the previous administration's plans for TPP as well. So either one who had become elected probably would end up in the same position we are now. 
What I do know is that our current commander in chief, uh, my, my boss in the military side, Donald Trump, the president of the United States, is a businessman. That's his background. And he wants to get the best deal possible. And as Assistant Secretary Wells said this morning, you know, America first, make America great doesn't mean America only. That would be ludicrous if it was America only. We're not an isolationist country. We haven't prospered and become who we are by staying at home. It's by building alliances and growing and partnering and spreading you know, opportunities amongst our partners and allies and friends globally that have allowed us to get to the position we are and also sustain peace and prosperity like we have in the Indo-Asia Pacific. So I think there will be something else. We won't be called TPP. But my belief you know, is that we'll see something where there will be either, there will obviously be bilateral engagements between the United States and countries and where it makes sense and it's a great deal, a good deal for both parties and everybody in the region, there'll be other deals that are made. There's no doubt in my mind because that's the way we'll go. Your Vice President Pence, when he visited the region, specifically said we have an enduring commitment to this region. If you don't have an enduring commitment, then you don't make deals. You don't try to move forward. Uh, Secretary Mattis uh, has called this a priority region, said that this is we have an enduring, uh, uh, unbreakable relationship that builds on the foundation of our prosperity and our security. Right? So I do believe there will be something coming. Whatever it's called, I don't know. Uh, and then as a military person with Pacific Command, we'll also engage and enforce as needed whatever we need to with that. But I, I think, keep positive. I'm the eternal optimist. I think there will be something coming. As far as uh, America's future, as I said, uh, you know, Admiral Harris, my boss, military, has said that uh, this region is of supreme importance to the future of our nation. Uh, and also I have a quote uh, that he said that the Indian Pacific Ocean and the economic, or the Indian and Pacific Oceans together are the economic lifeblood that link the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Northeast Asia, and the United States, and Oceania. It's what links us all together. And those oceans were once a physical, psychological barrier. But that's not the case now. They kept us apart. Now they're a maritime superhighway that brings us together. So we will be here, we will stay. We will continue to grow in our strength and alliances as America with the Indo-Asian Pacific region. Uh, there's no, again, there's no doubt in my mind and everything that I work on with Admiral Harris, that's the case. For that question, uh, I think yesterday, our Honorable Prime Minister very categorically explain the Hambantota is purely on economically that they move with China. So nothing to do with military. We have a military base there that will continue. Strategically, we have a military base, naval bases around Sri Lanka, purely to monitor the shipping and other activities. So we will have more, I mean, little bigger base in Hambantota since we have a slot there. So other than that, nothing to do with that. The Navy view is that we will look after the, mid, the, the security aspect of the harbor. All the harbors in Sri Lanka, especially Colombo, uh, North and the South Gaul, we do the security. We are responsible. We are the designated authority for ISPS implement. That's a mandatory by IMO. Likewise, uh, Hambantar also Navy. So another Navy can't come and do the ISPS or whatever the security. So we are. Very, that's very clear, it's purely on economically and the Navy. And the submarine issue you said that you asked, uh, actually this question raised to me when I visited to India when I was the Navy chief by Indian media. That all, you know, we are a non-aligned country, any ship can come on a goodwill visit. So that submarine also came to Sri Lankan port after getting the diplomatic clearance. So, but only thing, the government policy is that we will never ever permit anybody to compromise somebody else's security. So that is there. So generally, uh, we have a very good relation with India. We all talk, Indian, Indians were aware that was happening. But uh, the media level, they didn't know. So that's all about that I can tell you. Thank you. Um, yep, 13, round.
Uh, good morning. My uh, question is for General Hudson. Uh, I'm Abhijit from the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies. Uh, my question to you, General, is that we keep hearing a lot both from you and Admiral Harris on countering China, containing China in a sense, and rule of laws. Um, the question is that we hear a lot in terms of jargon and intangibles and very little in terms of actual tangibles and their cost. For example, what exactly would you like us to do navally? Um, our two fleets are incompatible. Uh, our data links don't talk to each other. If they start talking to each other, that part of our Navy becomes incompatible with the other part of our Navy. So what exactly are you proposing? Can you give us tangible political actions that you'd like to see from us and tangible military actions? Well, just to correct the record, I never said that we're containing China. Right. We've never said, Admiral Harris has never said we have an intent or a desire or a need to contain China. China is our largest economic trading partner, one of our largest. So there'd be no reason for us to have a, a, a negative relationship with them. We cooperate where we can, and we compete where we must, and then sometimes competition is good. So again, I just want to make sure I was clear on that. Uh, countering uh, their uh, erosion of certain rules-based international norms and, and, and regulations and rules that have built prosperity that help enable China to be as prosperous as they are in the whole Southeast Asia region, ASEAN and others, that has been because of peace and prosperity because people work together on rule-based order basis. They abided by the norms and rules. Our concern is, and Admiral Harris's concern is, that China is, is taking a different path, it seems, on the South China Sea. Not in other areas, maybe, but right there they are. Right? And I just want to mention, you know, we do freedom of navigation operations. They're not targeted against any specific country. Last year alone, uh, our U.S. military and Navy did 22 freedom of navigation operations against, I'm sorry, we did 20 against 22 nations, other countries. Some that are partners, some that are allies, and some that are just neighbors. So it's not targeted against China. The intent is to keep open free lanes of communication, lines of communication by international law, because not everybody can, can take, has the opportunity to demonstrate that. So we do it on behalf of everybody. Why? Because that builds prosperity. And as a nation, we want to be prosperous like everybody else. Now, to answer your other question, or actually maybe your more specific question about what can you do or what we want you to do, we want everybody to be cooperative and collaborate where we all can to include China. And we need to work together. Like an example is RIMPAC, where we bring together navies across the Indo-Asian Pacific. We invite China. In fact, they were the lead last year for our humanitarian disaster relief effort within the exercise, the sub-exercise. And their Navy was extremely professional, did a great job. I was there observing. And we had a good collaborative working relationship with them. That's what we want to do more of, is work together so then when there are issues that we disagree on, then we can work through those. But there'll always be communication issues. There'll always be uh, co connectivity, especially in today's age, because of intelligence reasons. that We can't specifically connect certain things. So we have to work around from the human factor, as I call it, to, to eyeball, eyeball together, to work together. Right? So again, it's in a general sense, everybody work together. And when one tries to step apart from what everybody's agreed to do, then all should try to encourage that person to step aside. Same thing with North Korea. We want China to work extremely hard to prevent North Korea from getting to the end state they've declared openly. That is our number one concern of Pacific Command, that he'll follow through with his threats, Kim Jong-un. And we need China's help, so we need to collaborate and cooperate with China greatly on that. But that doesn't mean we're going to stop doing normal, routine operations like freedom of navigation of the South China Sea. We take no position on the territorial sovereignty because it's not our area. We do have a position on keeping open what normal rules and laws allow, which is the navigation of those waters. Okay. Um, 23. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Siddharth, research fellow with India Foundation. Uh, my question is to Mr. Hartzell. Uh, sir, at a time when uh, United States policy of pivot to Asia is in limbo, then uh, uh, what kind of role do you see for U.S., specifically in the connectivity projects in Asia as well as in Africa in context of China's One Belt, One Road initiative? Thank you, sir. Again, I hate to say it, you're asking the wrong person. 
I'm, I'm the military. You know, I'm in the military. So that's an economic more issue. We are interested, obviously, in the effects of One Belt, One Road. Uh, but we're not for or against that. Uh, so I really don't have a statement. I know that uh, Assistant Secretary Wells mentioned it uh, in her speech yesterday. I really don't have much of a comment about that from, again, from the lens that I look through as a military lens. Okay. Um, yep, table eight. General Hartzell, uh, thank you very much for the speech. Uh, I would like to raise the issue of uh, the uh, Scarborough Shoal. Uh, just identify uh, yourself, please, for the rest uh, of the audience. Uh, my you name know. is Srikant Kondapalli. I teach in the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Uh, my query is, uh, last year, as you mentioned, uh, some 22 phone ops have been conducted. Uh, uh, historically, if you look at the phone ops, much of these are concentrated in the South American continent. Um, one or two in the Asia Pacific, uh, but last two, three years since the Obama administration, uh, these have been increased to three or four. Um, but we also see during the Trump administration, the phone ops has been uh, enhanced uh, in terms of uh, coming closer to the 12 nautical mile limit, crossing the 12 nautical mile limit, especially last two, three uh, phone ops. Um, my query is in relation to the Scarborough Shoal. Uh, Obama administration had put up the red line in terms of the Scarborough Shoal, where the Defense Secretary of the Philippines had suggested that the Chinese are building uh, structures uh, in those areas. Now, in the last one year, the Chinese have conducted air-to-air -air exercises uh, and also the Liaoning aircraft carrier has passed through these, uh, these uh, Miyako Strait as well as the, um, uh, the Taiwan-related uh, uh, you know, sea lanes. Uh, my query is uh, the uh, Pacific Command's responses towards the uh, construction, if any, by the Chinese in the Scarborough Shoal and control of those sea lanes of communications. You mentioned in your speech about the phone ops. This is a query in relation to the phone ops. Thank you for the question. Uh, collectively, in the Pacific Command as well, but even through our government, through our diplomatic side, you know, we've been working with China to decrease the tension that China has brought to the South China Seas. Okay? Part of the way that we're working on that to decrease the tension is through the freedom of navigation operations. And again, going within or without a 12-mile knock limit, again, if it's, if it's a man-made island, the, the court Court of Arbitration has said it's not an island. So that, that we take that, we use the, the rules and regulations that they've abided by, that everybody works with the UNCLOS and others, uh, to demonstrate that, we, that every nation should have the opportunity to have the freedom of navigation. Just because a nation builds an island from underneath the water and then says that's their territory, doesn't necessarily make it so, just because they claim it to be. So that's why we've demonstrated. What we would not like to see is in the Scarborough Shoals, that they do the same thing they've done in Fiery Cross Reef, Mistress Reef, and some other places, the Spratly Islands, Paracels, and other places. They haven't. They haven't started building anything, as far as we're, we know, in, in Scarborough Shoals. But that would be very problematic if they did. And, and we've encouraged China to talk with the Philippines. The Philippines talk with China about that, and they are talking. And that's their responsibility, to talk and to, and to resolve that dispute, because that's a territorial issue which we don't have a claim or we don't have responsibility over. It's just that if something uh, not under norm of law is built, then we will demonstrate our freedom of navigation you know, capability there. Okay? So again, we, we, would, we would not like to see anything built up like it has been in the Spratleys and the Scarborough Shoals for all the obvious reasons, I think. Uh, and, and, and the good news is that China hasn't done anything there in the past year. Um, and again, the other good news is that China and the Philippines are talking about it and discussing how they can collectively and collaboratively work together to prevent conflict between Coast Guards, militia, fishing vessels. Because that's the problem when ships bump each other. You know, people are trying to grab things, and uh, that's the problem. And we don't want to see that conflict. Okay, so I, I think that if you're talking about specifically about Scarborough Shoals. Oh, yes. Yeah, you, 16. Uh, 16. Yes, good, good afternoon. My name is Kum Carpentier. I have a technical question uh, for uh, General Hartzell regarding the 
Indian Ocean, um, you know, there is a, an awareness of a tremendous amount of technological uh, surveillance and monitoring of whatever is happening in these waters. As a technical person yourself, with the most powerful tools in the world, what would you say about, for example, the disappearance of the Malaysian flight uh, two years ago? Because it seems very strange that there has been no ability by any country to retrieve any kind of evidence. And yet, I mean, it would seem to fly in the face of uh, the technological state of our uh, monitoring and surveillance abilities worldwide. How do you explain such black holes in the surveillance system? And do you think this has a bearing on other such incidents that which could simply be undetected and unreported? Thank you. It's an interesting technical question, which I don't have an answer for, I'll be honest. Uh, I, I, I do know, having sailed the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans as a Marine on Navy ships, it's a big ocean. And there's a lot of open space water out there. So it's not physically possible to monitor all of the oceans, either under the water or above the water. Now there's satellites, but even satellites don't cover every square inch of, of the, the, the surface of our, our globe. Uh, so it is a mystery. It still is a mystery. I would like to know where did it go? How did it get there? Where is it now? All of us would uh, And it has a technological challenge the, the thing that I think we would like to see and I think it was secretary Wells mentioned as well is that countries do come together and work and maybe a naval exercise like RIMPAC that we do in the Pacific Ocean something in the Indian Ocean India PAC India RIMPAC uh, Would be a good because when navies work together and people talk together and they work their communications together like we do in RIMPAC, then when a disaster does happen, it's more quickly and readily accessible for those people to talk again instead of having to do it for the first time. So I think it's a great idea to have some kind of collective exercise uh, that would be in the Indian Ocean centric. I think it's a great, and we would love to be invited from Pacific Command to come and participate in that. And that's really one way, one of the few ways I think that you would have an opportunity to have more awareness an observation of things going on in the Indian Ocean. Because uh, right now everybody's kind of looking at it singularly. So again, I have no technical solution on, on, on how that plane disappeared. Again, we're all still looking for it. So. Right. Um, Can Ladies I? and gentlemen, that brings us to the, uh, the end of the interactive session. Oh, uh, may I request all of you to give a very warm round of applause to Admiral Pereira and General Hudson. And may I request Air Marshal P.K. Roy to kindly come forward to felicitate the speakers. Admiral James Pereira, okay. Or General James Hartzell, and Admiral Jayanta Pereira. Uh, thank you, General. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, this bring, uh, brings us to the end of the session. We will now move for lunch. The lunch has been laid uh, just, behind, just behind this hall where you had tea earlier. And we will reassemble here sharp at 2.30. Thank you. <laughs>